You know, I just pass by you. I just pass to somebody else. And that's what I said to God. I said to God, why did you choose me? Why? Out of all my family, my elder brother is so influential. He can just say one word and my parents will believe. Because my parents put their hope in him. They put, they looked up to him. I said, why me? I can't speak. I am not allowed to speak. I am the rebellious second child. You're causing me too many problems. You know? And I, seriously, I never liked that. Being that person who's, who goes home and says, Mom, you know what? If you're not going to give your life to Jesus, this and this and this and this, these are only hope. I couldn't bring salvation to my family. For many years, I had to struggle on my own. I had to make decisions on my own. I had to have difficulties and problems and go home and think about it myself. Because I didn't have a pair who could sit down and talk with me and say, let's pray about this. Let's see the will of God. You know what a blessing that is? If you've had that, you are blessed. You know? I used to go home and I can't tell my mom that somebody bullied me at school. I can't tell my mom anything. She would tell me, you have the strength to rise. <laughs> I come from a farmer's family, I tell you, you have to be tough. But God provided, He provided in every way. And I kept praying, God, why? Why didn't you say first my brother? And then He will say the word, and my parents will be saved, and I will be saved, and we'll be one happy Christian family. It would have been so much easier. You know, it's maybe you think this is foolish, but my mom suffered for 18 years with cancer. I think you have heard me share this testimony. 18 years, I've seen my mom. I was 18 years old, and I was a student. I was studying physiotherapy, and I remember her in hospital. I remember her in bed crying. I remember her getting out of bed. I remember her in radiotherapy. I remember all these places and all these experiences. My mom gave her life to Jesus only a few years before she died. A few years. And, and I don't know, I had just, I, I didn't have any other method. I had just stopped because I knew my mom was desperate. And I said, she needs Jesus, but I can't do nothing. And I kept praying, God, can't you save my brother? He will go to my mother's bed right now and say the word and she will believe and she may be healed and she... But God didn't see, you know, that he didn't see these things. He touched her in, her own, in, in his own way. My mom gave her life to Jesus when she came to Belgium. She came to visit us in Bible school. I was scared stiff. I said, my mom's coming to Bible school. What will she think? Oh, these are all holy people. If she rejected me, how? What will she say? But God, she was ready at that time. God just, I don't know what he did, but he made her heart fertile. Her heart was just fertile ground at that point in time. After she had persecuted me for many years. You know, but praise God. And she received the Lord. And I couldn't believe it. The last two years before my mom died, she used to send me messages and say, God bless you. You are such a blessing for me. I'm like, wow. I'm looking at that message and I can't believe my eyes. I can't believe it. I used to wake up in the night and say, God used to wake me and say, I'm healing your mother. I'm healing your mother right now. I'm like, okay, uh -huh, what am I supposed to do? And this is not an experienced Christian woman, so what, sh what should I do? I'm just pray. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And I sent her a message. I said, how are you? Three o'clock in the morning, she sends me back. Thank you for praying for me. Thank you for thinking of me. I said, she's awake. I sent her back and said, well, I think God is healing you. She says to me, she says, I know, I know, this is my family. So God doesn't see the time, he has a right timing for us. He doesn't see that your second child or which child you are in your family, you know. 
He doesn't see that if you are a woman or a man, he doesn't. You know, sometimes I wish he saw a little bit more, but <laughs> he doesn't. He gives us responsibility. The Bible says he makes us as priests. So if you think there is any limitation to you being a priest of God, I suggest that that limitation comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God. Except for sin, the Bible is clear. Except for sin, you are a priest of God. That's the only way you can lose your righteousness, is sin. The Bible is very strict with sin. Am I making people cry? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah? <laughs> so there's a word. There's a word that is uh, is a word that attacks the kingdom of God. That word is in my vocabulary is called norms. N O R M S. Norms. Louis is smiling because he knows about norms. Norms is uh, behaviors that we learn to do so that we are accepted by our society. You know, things we do to be good children, good wives, good husbands, good daughters, good... They are not written in the law. But we live by them. And Jesus broke those norms. You know? Yes. Do we think so? He was a socialist, so he broke the norms. You know, when Jesus uh, faced the, the men who brought the adulterous woman, it's a famous passage, everybody knows about it. The thing is, he broke some norms. People didn't like Jesus. Because, you know what? He could have done the same thing without breaking these norms. He could have done it as people expected him to do. But Jesus made a public scene of it. He pushed down, he crushed certain barriers to the ground before the people's eyes. He made a public scene. So when they brought the woman, they thought they were going to trap him. He didn't even look at the woman. He sat down and he was scribbling. Isn't that very respectful? You know, leaders come to you to ask you something and you just scribble. And he said, if any of you have no sin, you can throw the first stone. You know, let me ask you, if you are a man, would you have protected that woman? I don't think so. I, I, I won't be quick to judge, but very few men would have protected that woman. Because under the law and under spiritual law, she deserved to be stoned as an adulteress. You know, she deserved. So whether you are men or women, everybody of us would have run away. We wouldn't have taken that responsibility. Because that's the way we reason. That is the glasses we are looking at. That is the, the, the gospel we have been given. I mean, not gospel, the Bible gospel. The gospel by our society. To be Christian means to do one, two, three. If you don't do it, how can you say you are a Christian? You see? And I, again, I ask people, is it instituted by the Bible or by people? Make a difference. Because in a lot of countries in the world and churches in the world, when you go, you can sit down and say, this is biblical, but this is not biblical. It's a norm. It's because you traditionally do things that way. And sometimes God might ask you to do things another way. And are you prepared? And that is the whole question. Are we prepared? I'm not saying that we should challenge the norms and make a, a revolution everywhere we go. What I'm saying is, when our norms become our gods, all of the other gods, but you are the mighty God. No? That we should be able to be like Jesus. We should be able to say no or yes. The righteousness of God. This is what it means to be righteous. I will share with you one experience I had um, 
very interesting experience that I had in America. It was funny, it was interesting, it was, but I learned a lot. So when I went to America, I went to, um, I went to live with a Turkish family. I think you've heard me say this, this story. And uh, this, this family, of course, was Muslim family, but a very good family. You know, I, I used to live in the basement, but I used to hear everything, and I had to go through the main door. And apparently, the, the husband had won a green card lottery, one of these computer green card lotteries, you know. And he came to, to America to, um, to settle down with his four children. Three of them were university age, and there was a little boy who was 10 years old. And uh, they were all very good students. They were studying public policy and, and mechanics, and you know, they were all into school. And I could see this man, his dream was that his children would have the best. You know, he used to spend hours with his sons and teaching them. The mother didn't speak at all English. I used to tell her, Sherry, but you have to learn English. Yes, yes, that's all we said, you know? If we had to speak about something different, we needed translation most of the time. But they were a good family. She used to cook and she used to spend time in the home. And he used to just work and take care of his kids. So I knew when I went there, this family is a really exemplary family, you know? And then um, I told them the first day I went there, I said, listen, I said, I'm a Christian. You know, I said, I've never lived with Turks. And I said, I've never lived with Muslim people and I've never lived with Turks. So what am I going to do? And I told them, listen, I'm a Christian. And they said, it's okay, it's okay, no problem. They brought tea and cakes. This was the first day when they accepted me to live with them. And uh, they started to ask me, they said, oh, you are married, you have kids? Yes. I said, oh, who are your kids and your husband? I said, in Malta. <laughs> you know, that everybody was shocked that I, as a married woman and a mother, I was there studying. Everyone was shocked, and I knew. And then they said uh, to me, I said, listen, I said, my husband is a pastor. And I just shared with them the testimony of my husband, how he was a Muslim and how God healed him. They were like, oh. I said, now I'm either dead in this house, they're either going to kill me, or else I'm alive. I don't know. But I just said this testimony. I shared with them. I didn't know that the mother had rheumatoid